Well, I was saying to Yvette that uh, we better get going because I'm already a day late. So uh, February, February 20th here. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, some, some pretty radical changes which are going on in oceanography. Uh, there's a number of technological revolutions which, which are really changing our capability to measure the ocean, to model the ocean, to move instruments into the ocean, and they come uh, sort of none too soon because as we're all familiar, uh, this, uh, th these, these issues of global climate, uh, and not only global climate, but a lot of uh, other chemical changes which are kind of going on in the background, for example, tr triggered by the Green Revolution, uh, have enormous impacts on the ocean and in turn have enormous impacts on us. And, and we don't understand those very well at all. As a matter of fact, this is kind of the piece, if you will, of the climate puzzle that perhaps we understand the least well. Well, I'm, what I have here is a, a picture of a ship. And the ship really has been the uh, backbone of, of seagoing oceanography for, uh, for, dec for decades. And as a matter of fact, oceanography in many senses began by the analysis of records uh, from ships uh, by, by Maury. And, and you can see here uh, some rather pleasant conditions uh, out in, in this case, I think it was in Cape Cod Bay. Uh, and you'll see sort of the features of a ship. The important features of the ship are things like cranes, A-frames, basically equipment for putting, putting devices over the side. Because basically, this surface here that you're looking at is really, is really opaque. It's opaque to satellites. You can measure the surface of it. You can infer what's under it. But by and large, the only way you really know what's going on below the surface is by introducing instruments into the interior. And so as a consequence, oceanographers go to sea and lower a variety of different things into the ocean and onto the seafloor. Now, this is pretty expensive. Uh, this ship here, which is a smaller ship, is probably about oh, $18,000 a day or something like that to operate. And you typically sort of double the cost to when you add the oceanographic, uh, the oceanographers on board. And pretty much one person uses it at a time, or one research group uses it at a time. So this isn't necessarily the, the way to really get a view of the ocean, because you're limited in how long you can be to sea. I think the longest I was out in this one was three weeks. Uh, the longest that I've been out at sea at all for at a, at a time is two months. Uh, and of course, everyone's out there the whole time, regardless of whether or not you're doing something productive on, on your science. Uh, and you've got, a, and you've got a, a, a marvelous, marvelous platform to work from. But of course, you can only be in one place at one time. And you're pretty much up here on the surface interacting with whatever you've put below. And of course, there's other aspects of going to sea, which is it isn't always nice out. So this is the view off the bridge uh, in uh, Labrador Sea. Uh, this was a, a cruise up there, sort of January, February of, uh, of 98. Uh, and, and unfortunately, this was, this was pretty typical. You know, sort of you get sort of a period of four days when things would be nice, and then you'd get another bit of nasty weather blowing through. My cabin was right down there. It was a very unpleasant cruise. <laughs> and really, when conditions are like this, it's really hard to put things over the side, and it's hard to work. Now, oceanographers, before I started oceanography, used up all the good spots is kind of the way I looked at it. They did all their oceanography in the tropics, and they did all the great stuff down there. And when I signed on board, they said, you know what? We've changed our mind. The really interesting stuff is up in these high latitudes. Uh, why don't you go there, Jim? And so uh, I spent actually most of, my, most of my career, my seagoing career, going to kind of the, the, the less attractive places in oceanography. But these are really the places that we need to know about, that we need to be able to work, uh, because these are the places where right now there's really no, there's no measurements. And here, for example, is a picture in the Antarctic. Uh, but equally well, uh, that what I'm about to say applies to the Arctic. And you can see the ship here is turning in the ice. It's coming out. The reasons it's coming out is we've broken every piece of equipment that we could hang over the side. So basically, we're trailing, trailing in this case, air guns behind the ship, uh, trying to measure. Well, this is basically a geophysical cruise looking at, look, looking at a, a, a triple junction point uh, in uh, seafloor spreading. And the air gun, there's one air gun there left running. You can kind of see the pool from it. The hydrophone array isn't working. The magnetometer has been damaged. And what's happening is ice is getting down under the keel of the ship. It's going under the tow lines, and then it's throwing the equipment into the air. And, and we've broken the equipment. We've broken the spares. And now it's time to head out of the ice and, and get everything repaired. And really, as we now know, a lot of the really, in, a lot of the really interesting things are going on at high latitudes uh, under ice. Uh, and uh, you know you can't simply simply can't uh, can't do your science if you're limited 
if you're limited to working off of the surface in an icebreaker. And this really highlights it. This was my last time to high latitudes. It was 2001, uh, actually not too long after 9-11. Uh, and this little blue track is kind of where the ship went. Uh, and you can see about here my persuasive powers with the uh, captain give out. I can't get him to go any further into the ice. <laughs> uh, because what he's afraid of is you can see sort of the wind blowing off here. This whole, the, whole, the whole ocean is basically freezing at this point. And what he doesn't want to get is he doesn't want to get locked in the ice. It's very embarrassing. This is on a Coast Guard ship. It's very embarrassing for a Coast Guard captain to call, have to call for help. The other thing you notice is that we don't go in straight lines. Why do we not go in straight lines? Well, the reason we don't go in straight lines is it actually uses an enormous amount of power, or in this case, oil, on an icebreaker to pound your way through the ice. So in fact, even though this looks like solid ice in most of these spots, there's all these leads. And what the ship is doing is kind of winding its way through the we the, these leads, uh, which uses much less fuel than pounding through the ice, uh, and only pounding through the ice when it has to. And, and, and uh, at this point here, now this is October, uh, it's getting dark enough up there. The sun is set. It's not coming back again. Uh, and most of the time, you have sort of a twilight, and you can see. But at night, you really can't see anything. And, and uh, you know, as it gets darker, you can't see anything. And so the problem is, is you can be pounding your way through the ice, where 200 yards over that way, there's a nice big lead that the ship could be in. And at that point, at that point, the, the, the ship, the captain says, well, it's time, it's time for us to turn and leave and, and come out. By the way, another very interesting thing about this picture is that it's not frozen from here to here. Sort of about here, we were getting ice predictions, and they said that the ice was supposed to freeze up in this region here. And it didn't for, for until literally as we came down here and sailed through here, this ice was moving up against, this is Svalbard here. Uh, and uh, at that point, at that point, it finally was freezing. But there was still, the leads were steaming. And as we lifted pieces of ice out, what we found was the bottom of the ice showed it was melting. And what was happening is a little bit of the Gulf Stream, basically, is coming up here and melting the ice from, melting the, ice from the bottom. So you got the air doing it the best job it can of freezing. And meanwhile, the ocean, that residual warmth, uh, actually, actually melting, melting the ice pack. So to understand all of these things, we've been developing a range of different types of robotic systems. And those are the kinds of things I'm going to spend a good bit of my talk uh, discussing. Uh, remotely operated vehicles actually used by the oil and gas industry and the military first, uh, but then adopted by uh, the oceanographic community. This is one of our two vehicles at Ambari. On the bottom here is actually a sled for letting us put cable along the bottom. Here's a mooring. Uh, we use, make very heavy use of moorings. We'll put moorings out. Uh, 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 there's moorings all basically all over the world's oceans, a good string of them across, for example, the equatorial Pacific, which was a large part of what helped unravel sort of the El Nino-La Nina story. Uh, and these, these here usually have a string of instruments going down into the water column underneath them. This is a more sophisticated mooring actually connected to a fiber optic cable. That fiber optic cable and actually uh, conductors in there as well go all the way to the seafloor and then support instruments on the seafloor. And I'll show you a little bit more of that. Now, of course, these are fixed in one place, and this is attached to a ship, right? That cable comes back aboard a ship, which provides the power, and there's a bunch of people driving it around by joysticks. This is an autonomous underwater vehicle. It's actually what I've spent most of my career working on. It has no cable. You put it in the water. Uh, you've told it what to do when you deploy it, and hopefully you've told it well. It goes off and does it, and then you talk to it again when it comes back. Uh, these days, acoustic comms really only works out to a couple kilometers, and, you wanna, and what you're using these to do is to get much larger ranges of coverage and ultimately uh, a much more pervasive view of the ocean. And here's another, another aspect of ocean observing systems which is beginning to happen, which is establishing, in effect, observatories on the seafloor. And what you see here is the ROV here, uh, with this ROV, in fact, doing an installation. In fact, this is in our test tank pre preparation, uh, in preparation for deployment in the ocean. So this is a range of different types of instrumentation and equipment which is being developed. Now, really, in the showed you a bunch of pieces, but really what's exciting about these is how they all go together. So in the past, again, sort of you go to sea on a ship, and one person kind of, or one research group uses a ship at a time, and you get sort of a very 
comprehensive view of what's going on in the vicinity of the ship. What we really want to do is get a picture of what's going on in the ocean synoptically. We want to have this idea of what's going on three-dimensionally. And I'll show you some pictures as to why that's important. Basically, this is a highly, highly variable environment. And what's increasingly happening is we're developing these ocean observing systems, which uses a range of different assets. So we have real problems underwater. Radio waves don't penetrate the water, so you can't communicate to things. There's no oxygen down there, so you can't run a gasoline engine. You've got to basically carry your oxidizer with you. Or you have to use batteries, which aren't terribly, which aren't, uh, aren't terribly uh, good, really, at storing energy when it boils down to it. Uh, our sensors are not that great. We're pretty good at measuring the physical ocean, but you know the chemical and biological properties are really tough. And in order to do those now, you actually need something with a bit of payload. So in order to in order to sort of get around all these limitations, well, since there is no silver bullet, what we do is we construct a variety of different types of platforms, and then we build up observing systems by using their complementary capabilities. And I'll show you. And this actually is a picture of a field program that occurred in uh, yeah, actually in 2000. So we're, we're getting, uh, we've run two more of these field programs and really are beginning to understand how this all, all, uh, all works. So the evolution really of the remotely operated vehicle, it's kind of instructive. This took decades to occur. But, you know, initially people said, hey, you know, we've got these cables, uh, we've got TV cameras, let's stick a camera at the end of a TV cable, we'll put it underwater and we'll get to see what's, we'll get to see what's down there without having to go in ourselves. And in fact, the first ones were really used in the oil and gas industry. So I have a friend who started, who, who was with that company, and he tells me that what they were used for was inspecting the work estimates that uh, work that divers were reporting so in other words if you were if you were a company and you had a bunch of divers come out there you would ask them well how much work is down there and they tell you and you say well okay you have no way of verifying and you pay them and for all you know they're going down there and talking about sports right and then coming up and so what they would do is they built these uh, vehicles with these little cameras so they could go down and inspect them. And I'm told that the first vehicle was actually lost to a suspiciously evenly cut cable uh, tether. So, uh, so perhaps they weren't welcomed by all. But right now, right now, you know, these are much more than eyeballs in the ocean. Of course, what happened was they, they put manipulators on them. And you can kind of see down here, this is actually a chemical sensor being moved over uh, what, you know, we usually call a a cold seep. It's one of these chemosynthetic communities on, on the seafloor. And then they became work platforms, so bigger, heavier vehicles capable of trenching in the seafloor. Uh, this is Tiburon, which is more or less our flagship vehicle being deployed out of the Western Flyers. So you can see this isn't exactly a moon pool because it doesn't come down to the water, but uh, uh, it uh, eliminates motion when you run it from the uh, center of the ship. But then, sort of a surprise to everybody, uh, was that uh, they became ba basically laboratories for in situ experiments uh, in in uh, in the ocean and Peter Brewer at our organization is really the guy who uh, who led that but you can see these are these are you know running one of these things is uh, is quite an operation it, it requires a group of people who are really experts at, at sea operations uh, these are very nice conditions you need to be able to operate it in rough conditions as well uh, and that's, you know, an 8,000 pound vehicle on there with a lot of things that all have to work for the vehicle to work. And there's a whole control room on the surface uh, which people are interacting with the system from. And here's sort of a front look at it. Uh, in this case here, I think this is an NMR experiment that uh, Peter ran with some people from Schlumberger. Uh, and I won't go into the details of it. I'll just say that, that at this point, there was really a transition. As opposed to going down to the ocean and looking at it or grabbing something and bringing it back and analyzing it in the lab, began to take the laboratory to the seafloor. Now, of course, the problem here is that you're only down for the duration of the dive. And what you'd really like to be able to do is carry out experiments over a longer period. And, and that's really one of, the, one, of the big, one of the big changes which is coming in ocean sciences. So these cables, if you, instead of running that cable back up to the ship, kind of picture this. You have the ROV and you deploy it out to, this is uh, the Monterey Canyon here. That's our, our home institution. There's Monterey Peninsula there, Santa Cruz up here. This is Smooth Ridge. That's 900 meters. This is about 64 kilometers of cable running from the shore out to this underwater node and providing about 10 kilo kilowatts of power and internet connectivity to eight different connectors here on the seafloor, which you can go down and plug into. 
So you can kind of picture this is sort of like you took your ROV out there and you didn't take it back up. You just drove home and kept spooling out cable. Actually, it's a little better than that, right? Because, because now you really can support a lot more power, actually, than you can support on the, uh, on the, uh, on the ROV. And the idea here is this, is this supports a whole range of activities, but one of them is the laboratory on the seafloor type activity. So you can also see things like, well, you can't tell so well, but there's seismometers that you would hook into here. So right now we have seismometers out of Monterey Bay, but we don't get that data back but every three months. So if there's an earthquake now and you want to know, well, what did it say from that, we'll say, well, we'll tell you as soon as we get, get in the ship, go out, collect the data, and bring it back. That's the way things are in the ocean. You can't, radio waves don't penetrate through the surface, and it costs a lot of money to put one of those moorings out with a surface expression. So this actually provides that connectivity to get that real-time data back and make that instrument just like it's you know, next to you in the lab next door where you're interacting with it and where power isn't so much of an issue because power is an enormous constraint. Well, what kinds of problems might you apply this, uh, apply this to? Well, this is kind of a familiar chart, uh, I think, to, to many of you. Uh, so you see time here on this axis. This is depth of the ocean. And basically what's happened is, of course, uh, and I think this is a pretty familiar story, there's a lot of carbon dioxide that's been put in the atmosphere, sort of about half of it's already ended up in the ocean. Uh, the rest of it, most of it will end up in the ocean as well, and that has consequences for the ocean. What it does is it changes the pH. It makes the ocean a more acidic ocean. Well, what does that mean? Um, well, in the upper ocean, there's a lot of variability in pH anyhow, so mm, you know, maybe, maybe it's not as big a concern down there. The deep ocean, however, is a pretty quiet place. It's pretty uniform around the world. Those are really big shifts in pH uh, that are being described there. Maybe, maybe that's going to have really dramatic consequences for, for the ecosystem of the ocean, and these ones up at the surface probably do too. So, so, for example, you depend on half of, the product, half, of, half of the oxygen we breathe comes from the phytoplankton in the ocean. Well, do those, are those phytoplankton going to survive here at, at these, uh, at, uh, when you drop pH by this? I mean, there's a lot of people who say, well, I tried it in the lab and they all died. Uh, now, you know, those aren't exactly definitive experiments, but the point is, is, that, is that this is not a trivial warning. I mean, this is, this is something we really have to pay attention to. And so one of the things that has been done on land uh, you know, people have asked the consequences of, of elevated uh, 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 CO2 on, for example, plants. You know, you elevate CO2, do plants take up more carbon dioxide, and do you get rid of carbon dioxide faster that way? Uh, and do you end up with sort of increased crop productivity? You know, there's some, some pluses here anywhere. Well, in the ocean, uh, and so what they do is they set up these, these uh, experiments where they release carbon dioxide, uh, in these giant enclosed areas and see how it affects the, uh, the plants uh, the, and some trees uh, and the you know, ecosystems inside. Well, so here's the beginning of trying to do that in the ocean. What you want to do is go down to some isolated spots in the ocean or some defined spots in the ocean and run this experiment where you release, in effect, an acid. So you're going to say that I think that the biggest consequence here is changing the pH. Change the pH here in the interior of this volume and, and in effect, see what that does to, to the organisms in there. And in fact, this has been built. So there it is on the seafloor, uh, looking at the bottom, which is more or less the enclosed area with the diffusers around the base. And now we're coming in to plug into it. Uh, there we go, uh, plugged into it and now dispensing the acid. There's an organism that, that swam through there. And now the idea is, of course, that you, you, you know, having seen that, you immediately say, well, geez, that organism just swam right through it. How much did you really learn from that? And of course, you're only down there for an ROV dive. And that's, that's completely right. I mean, that's completely a problem. And so now this is where this intersects with these cabled observatory systems. Because what you need is you need to do this over a long period of time. And you need the power and you need the presence in order to support it. And so here's the idea of basically running these uh, systems out offshore in, in running these elevated, uh, elevated uh, CO2 experiments in confined areas. And so Peter Brewer, our organization, has been, a, has been a pioneer at this. Now, the thing is, of course, sometimes you don't want to be right next to shore. You know, the cable is pretty expensive, and laying the cable is expensive. So then what you do is you use a, a mooring system. So this mooring system, it's not, you know, it doesn't provide the same power to the seafloor by a long stretch. Uh, and it doesn't provide, uh, you know, internet level connectivity either. 
Uh, but it does provide connectivity. So you can imagine using Iridium, Global Star, depending on where you are, these various uh, satellite systems give you some connectivity, and, and you use those typically because they have omnidirectional antennas. Uh, there are higher bandwidth systems, but they required steered antennas, which use more power, and that trades against the instruments you can power. So there's an interesting trade space here. And how big a mooring you can fit on an oceanographic vessel is also a big deal to us. So that kind of limits the size system that you want to put to sea. So here's a system which really only generates about 60 or 70 watts of power uh, continuously, but it runs that all the way down to the seafloor, and then using the ROV on the seafloor, we've installed a variety of instruments. And in fact, this is deployed out off uh, Monterey now in a place called Shepherd's Meander. Char Charlie Paul is, in fact, the lead scientist for this. Uh, and what they're looking at there is canyon events. Uh, it turns out the Monterey Canyon is a very, very dynamic environment. There's a lot of slides and a lot of active movement of sediment uh, in the upper canyon. Uh, we know that because it trashes our equipment every time we put it in there. Uh, and in the lower canyon, the question is as well, can we maybe characterize these events where our equipment isn't trashed you know, a week after we put it in? And here's, here's the uh, first, deployment, first deployment of uh, this. Now, the other thing that you can do with these, though, is you can begin to ask other questions, provided you have the instrumentation. So one, one very exciting part of oceanography, which intersects with these new capabilities, uh, is, is really a, a, a microbial oceanography. And there, they're asking the fundamental questions. I mean, it is totally back to basics. You know, who's there? Who's there? I mean, some of the most prevalent organisms in the world really, have really only been discovered in the last decade or so. Uh, and these are all, this is all possible because of the advances being made in the uh, genomics community. So, so once you know who's there, how do they respond to changes in the chemical and physical environment? Now, you've got to keep in mind that in every drop of water, there's maybe tens of thousands of organisms, and each one of those is transforming the chemistry of the ocean. So, so in effect, you, you know, looking at the ocean and just thinking of it as physical water, you know, with a bit of salt added in, is just completely wrong. Uh, it's actually, it's actually a, a living ocean in a very real sense, not not just in the big fish in it, but every drop of it. And those those organisms are transforming the ocean in effect while you watch in ways that we don't understand. They're pushing the electrons around from higher to lower energy levels, and so on. And how does that all play out? So what role do they play in the biogeochemical cy cycling, food, food webs, and maintenance of global cli climate? So for example, in the nitrogen cycle, uh, you know, there seems to be a pretty big imbalance in the nitrogen cycle uh, you know, on, the oceanic, uh, on the oceanic side of it. Uh, you know, what role do these organisms play? And can they, buffer? can they buffer that? Can we use specific organisms as indicators of environmental change? So if you put something out in the ocean, uh, and see a certain, you know, Pseudonychia, for example, which is a toxic uh, 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 species in, that we see along the West Coast, uh, is that an indicator that something, something has gone wrong? And in effect, of course, you want to know sort of the fundamental human health things. You know, are these toxic organisms uh, present? And here's a device uh, uh, being developed by Chris Scholin, which is really kind of a robotic system. It's probably the most complicated robot that we have going in Ambari. Uh, and what it does is it does, it does this, this uh, basically uh, in situ uh, 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 DNA detection of marine organisms. And in order to do that, it has to do a lot of complicated processing of the water. And so you can see here, here is the second generation system in the lab. Here's the first generation system behind it. And here it's getting deployed off a ship. There it is. They're testing it in the uh, uh, test tank. So let me just... Uh, there we go. And so this kind of is a picture, again, sort of courtesy of Chris Scholin, which shows how this thing functions in water. So here's the instrument. What it's going to do is it's going to move one of these pucks over. So these pucks are the key elements. It's going to pull this water in from the outside. As it pulls the water in from the outside, it's going to filter, it's going to capture these organisms on the filter paper. Then it's going to in introduce some chemicals and heat it to break down the cellular material, get the the, the uh, uh, organisms basically uh, homogenized, and now it's going to do a series of processing steps, in effect pulling material, pulling uh, material off of the uh, uh, chip, and then running uh, a series of chemicals over intended really to attach uh, fluorescent probes to to the organisms in these uh, in these uh, chemical probe arrays, and basically where it lights up in there, it's told you where 
which, which in effect fragments of DNA are indeed present and which organisms therefore might be present. And it gets telemetered back to show to shore. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff, which, uh, which uh, Chris, Sholin is, uh, Chris Sholin has been doing. Um, no, I didn't want to do that. Exciting as it is. Uh, okay, so now the next next thing I want to talk about are autonomous underwater vehicles. So there's a younger me next to my first little robot, <laughs> and uh, so I've been doing this for a while. That was a C squared, and we used that as a an int actually really as a software test bed. It was kind of how we learned our lessons: what's hard to do, what's easy to do. And this was one of our next vehicles here. You can see here this is actually under ice. This is my my first time in the the Arctic actually, uh, and it's homing on a net. Uh, which we used to recover the vehicle in an ice camp up, uh, actually up north of Dead Horse, Alaska. And here, actually, it has a, an array on the front, and that's actually a mine uh, down there on the bottom. So that's, that's intended to find, find buried mines there. And this is actually, you can't tell, this is in Lake Winnipesaukee. These are tests. That's uh, John Leonard is now, now a faculty member at, uh, at, uh, at MIT. So these vehicles have a variety of different uses. And over, over about, I would say, a decade and a half, they've gone from kind of technological curiosities, which you know, kind of took a team of engineers to get them to the ocean. And you know, we all sort of crossed our fingers and held our breath when it went in the water and hoped it came back to now being used very routinely. Uh, these, a variety of these systems, they're available commercially from a number of different companies. Uh, and they're used uh, by a variety of different industries and, of course, by the uh, scientific community. One of our uh, pride and joys is our mapping vehicle. It carries a multi-beam echo sounder on it, and it is capable of building very high-resolution seafloor maps. So in fact, this map was created because we were laying the Mars cable down here. And the maps that we had done by traditional means sort of indicated there might be a problem, but didn't tell us how to solve it. So we went in and created a high-resolution map with, uh, with the vehicle. And here it is getting deployed off of, uh, off of the back of our vessel. And you can see that this is a pretty large, by my standard, a pretty large AUV. And the reason it's large is because uh, that's what it takes in order to carry those various uh, sonars on board. The wavelength of sound in ocean is one of those physical constraints uh, so far we, we haven't really been able to get around. And that vehicle actually came from an Arctic program. So here's a vehicle which we actually did test in the Arctic. It launched these little message buoys, melted through the ice. It was quite an exciting project. Uh, uh, uh. So building observatories uh, beneath the waves, how do we put all these things together? Well, we've got that AUV I showed you. It really only has an endurance of about a day. On the other hand, it, it has great capacity for sensors. So you know, things like that ESP, you could imagine it going in here. On the other hand, we also work with systems like this. It's a little glider. It goes very slowly. And it carries very little in the way of sensors, but it lasts for months. And then there's other things which don't have any ability to control their position. They just go up and down in the water column, and they last years. And of course, they also carry very little in the way of sensors. And we've been doing a lot of work in the uh, Monterey environment here. Now, this is a picture of winds. So these, these lines are the direction of the winds. The background color is intensity. Uh, there's Monterey Bay.